Okay, this is the first of two chapters on long-term finance. This one is types and sources of long-term funds. And this is the plan. <clears throat> we'll have a look at equity finance. We'll have a look at debt finance, the two different classic ways of obtaining finance from a company point of, point of view. Where do they get their funds from? We'll have a quick look at the stock and bond markets and the role of advisors, which is linked to the stock and bond markets. Advisors get involved in coordinating the way in which they, they work and helping with the smooth process. So equity finance, debt finance, stock and bond markets, role of advisors. First of all, equity. We're talking about the issue of finance. And here it's the issue of shares. Two types of shares. There's ordinary shares and there's preference shares. We'll have a look at both of them starting with ordinary shares. And it's very important we get our terminology right. Think of this from the point of view of a company. If a company wants to obtain finance and get some cash, it will do what's called issuing share capital. So it can issue an ordinary share, which is just a piece of paper with share written on it. And it's issued with an associated par value, which is sometimes called the nominal value. And that will be written on the share. One dollar, fifty cents, five dollars, whatever it might be. The company doing the issuing decides on the par value. If shares are being issued for the first time, if this company has just been created, then the chances are the shares will actually be issued at their par value. They can be issued at higher, but that is normally going to be once the company has established a track record and has got a sort of loyal customer base and is generating income and profit. So to start with, ordinary shares are issued with a par value and the chances are they will be issued at a par value. Each share gives you a right to vote. So one share, one vote. It's possible this might not be the case, but I think we should assume with ordinary shares that it always will be. So ordinary shares will give you the right, but not the obligation, the right to participate, get involved in the way in which the company is being run. So to help appoint directors, to suggest auditors, to talk about the long term strategy, that kind of thing. So the ordinary share capital or the ordinary shareholders are effectively the owners of the business and they can dictate what happens in that business. So they're issued with a par value, you have a right to vote. You can receive a return on your investment, you can receive a dividend. You're not entitled to a dividend, ordinary shares can pay a dividend, it's up to the company to decide whether or not they do. So there's a significant amount of risk associated with owning an ordinary share because you don't know whether you're going to get a return on your cash. If the company that you invest in and has issued your shares goes into liquidation, in other words, it ceases to exist, it gets wound up and divided up into bits and, and sold off, um, the ordinary shareholders are entitled to receive a share of the assets at liquidation, what's left at liquidation. The amount they get will be restricted to the amount they invested in the first place. And they're actually, as we'll see later on in these slides, going to be quite low down in a big long queue of people that are waiting to be paid. So they, in theory, can receive a share. A lot of the time, there's nothing left by the time it gets down to the ordinary shareholders. So, key with ordinary shares, there is a right to vote. You can get involved in the running of the business and you are possibly going to receive a dividend. Ordinary shares can be issued in a number of different ways. And there are three on here. This is a way, the ways in which company can actually sell shares. They can issue them at market price, at market value, which hopefully will be going up and up and up, although it doesn't necessarily happen. Looking at the, the there's an example of the second one in a little while, so we'll do that one, but we'll look at the bottom one first. An issue at market price is where shares are sold for cash value, market value. A bonus issue is where uh, shares are actually given away for free. So there's no cash being received. Those shares still entitled to vote, still entitled to a dividend, possibly going to receive a dividend. Normally a bonus issue would be issued to existing shareholders in a proportion according to what they own already as a thank you for investing in the company in the first place. 
Alternatively, there's a rights issue. Now, market right, market price issue is cash being received for the full value. A bonus issue is free shares given away. A rights issue is somewhere in between. So a rights issue, if the market value of the share was, say, $10 and the par value was $1, the rights issue could be set anywhere in between there. So maybe if the market price was 10, the rights issue would be set at perhaps 8, and the shares would be sold at 8 to existing shareholders normally as a little bit of a thank you for their loyalty. They're not getting a share for free, but they're getting a share for less than it would normally cost at market value. Companies can decide whether or not to use market price issues, rights issues, or bonus issues. Looking in a little bit more detail at a rights issue, because it's kind of the complex one, the combination of the other two, really. The rights issue is an issue for cash, isn't it? Cash is being received. The amount of cash being received, however, as we said on the previous slide, is lower than it would be if you were selling the shares at market price. If that's the case, the rights issue will actually drag the market price down a little bit. So whatever the market price was before, the example that we've got here is the market price before the rights issue is $1.60. Whatever that market price is now, after the rights issue, theoretically and probably in practice, the value of the share will come down. So if the market price of the share before the rights issue was $1.60, if we have a one for two rights issue at $1.20, that means one new share for every two that exist already and the one new share is being sold at $1.20. We can calculate what's called the theoretical X rights price, the TERP, the price of a share, the market value of a share in theory immediately after the rights issue. So for every two shares that already exists at $1.60 that's a total value of 320, isn't it? Two lots of 160. There's now one new one at 120. So that means we've now got three shares at a total value of three dollars of four dollars forty, sorry, four dollars forty. If we then take that four dollars forty and divide it through by the number of shares in each one of these little blocks, then we can work out the TERP, the theoretical X rights price which we expected to be less than 160 and more than 120 and it is it's $1.47. So a rights issue will drag the share price down a little bit. Another type of share, preference shares. Let's look at the characteristics of preference shares. Preference shares, like ordinary shares, will be issued with a par value, a face value written on them. Preference shareholders, the investors that buy these shares, do not get a vote. So then that looks as though perhaps ordinary shares are better, doesn't it? Because in ordinary shares you get to participate, get to be involved in the running of the business. Preference shares, no vote. Preference shareholders, however, will receive a dividend. So that may be, suggest that preference shares are more beneficial than ordinary shares. Because with ordinary shares you don't necessarily get a dividend. It's actually really impossible to say whether preference shares or ordinary shares are better. It depends on your attitude and it depends what you want. But the differences are preference shares, no vote. Preference shares will receive a dividend. And that dividend will be a fixed amount. So if the company performs really, really well, the preference shareholders get the same amount anyway. As a bonus, as a, as a good thing, as an advantage, if the company performs really, really badly, the preference shareholders still get the same amount of dividend. So there's a difference between preference shareholders, preference shares and ordinary shares. Preference shareholders are also entitled to the share of an, to a share of the assets of the company on liquidation if the company ceases to exist. And preference shareholders, as the name suggests, take preference. They get in first before the ordinary shareholders. They're still actually reasonably low down in the queue but they get paid back before the ordinary shareholders, so in theory there's less risk associated with preference shares. So, preference shares and ordinary shares issued at a par value. Preference shares, no vote. Ordinary shares carry a vote. Preference shares will receive a dividend and it will be fixed. Ordinary shares will not necessarily receive a dividend and it will be variable. 
They both get a share of the assets of the company on liquidation, but the preference shareholders get their cash first. As it says right at the bottom, before the ordinary shareholders, but as we've also said, after quite a lot of other people that we'll see later. A little bit more detail on preference shares. Now, we're talking about, we started anyway, talking about equity finance. Having a look at preference shares, sometimes preference shares are what we call redeemable, and it will say if they are redeemable. If they're redeemable, that means that they're issued and cash is received, but redeemable means repayable. So that means that the cash will be paid back later to the people that invested in the company in the first place. That means that redeemable preference shares are not equity finance. Redeemable preference shares are actually debt finance and will be classified as a liability. If the preference shares are irredeemable, that means that the cash is received and it is never going to end up being repaid back to the person that paid out the cash in the first place. In which case there is no obligation to pay out cash later. Irredeemable preference shares are classified as equity. It will always tell you whether shares are redeemable or irredeemable. Sometimes you will see preference shares being described as cumulative. Sometimes you will see preference shares described as non-cumulative. If they're cumulative, it just means that if in one particular year, the company that has issued the shares cannot afford to pay the dividend, that dividend just gets rolled up and paid in the following period. So it will always get paid. So if you can't pay the dividend in year one, you have to pay two dividends in year two or three dividends in year three. If the preference shares are non-cumulative, that means that if the company cannot afford to pay the dividend in one year, then it does not actually pay that dividend and it gets rolled up into the next year. As far as preference share capital is concerned, the chances are probably that it will be cumulative and then look and see whether or not it's redeemable or irredeemable probably redeemable. Most preference shares will be classified as liability. So we're looking at shares and you think the shares will be equity. Well, equity is when there's no associated fixed cost, which would be your ordinary share capital. Preference shares can be either.